Hi everyone, I'm Allison Allen, I'm Chief People Officer. I have the, the distinct pleasure to actually do a conversation with Dr. Chris Enven today. Um, you guys, hopefully you were on on Monday, but this is an amazing um, associate uh, director, a, a professor. Um, I, I actually was listening to the session on Monday and I was like, in some respects, preacher, but I know that's probably not necessarily what we should be saying right now. But it was just an amazing thing. And this, is, this conversation and, and, and keynote, and this, this conversation is literally just to get a little deep, deeper. So I'm gonna ask my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Emden to join us and we're just gonna dive into this conversation. I am here. I'm really excited to engage in dialogue with you. Um, I am Chris Emden, African-American man, brown skin, sitting in front of a gray wall with a, a window on the side of me. And again, like last time, a huge smile on his face because I get to talk with Allison Allen this afternoon. Yes, and I actually did not describe myself. Um, I am an African-American woman. My hair is pulled back tight um, uh, because we know we need to do that sometimes. I am sitting in front of a brown cabinet um, and I'm wearing an, a sort of an olive green shirt. So let's get started. So in Monday's inspiring keynote, you discussed living in and educating during multiple related pandemics. You know, one of the things I'm very curious about, at what point did you actually make a connection or connect the dots between various pandemics? Let's be more specific. The connection between COVID-19 and systemic racism. I think that that connection between COVID and racism emerged almost immediately for me. Uh, because right away in my community, I live in the Bronx, I, we were just so affected so rapidly, so quickly, and, and in such a way that sort of like took the community by storm. And I realized that that just wasn't the case everywhere else. So as a scientist, the connections between COVID-19 and the impact on communities of color who've been socioeconomically disadvantaged emerged rather quickly. And right away, I said, oh my gosh, this is, this is, the, this is the race class phenomenon emerging within this thing. Um, and then what I started thinking more deeply about it was when we had the issue with George Floyd, which emerged again in the response again. So it's sort of an ever evolving complexity of these pandemics and their connections. But with the emergence of COVID-19, it was almost immediate. You talked a lot, you talked a lot on Monday about you know, you, you, you made a lot of connections between COVID-19, systemic relation, um, uh, racism, but you also talked about PPE and, and teaching artists putting on PPE. Just say, just say a couple more points around that. You know, I always, I've always believed that artists have the key to unlocking all that is beautiful in the world. I, I think a world without art, without, without all the aspects of art to sort of unlock like the beauty in the world, it would, would just not be a world worth living. And so I, I begin with that because I believe that artists and educators and then art educators are these magical human beings that, that, that sort of are portals to these new dimensions. And because we have this opportunity to be able to sort of help the world reimagine themselves, you know, we are the ones who need to be saved the most and protected the most and, and hidden from all the ills and horrific things in the world. And so when I talk about PPE as it relates to artists and art educators, it's so we can protect ourselves so that we can allow ourselves to be the portals to a new dimension of existence. Um, and for me, it's about all of us. I mean, we all need to protect uh, the beauty that is us and the art that is us. And in a world that obscures all that's beautiful and magical and loving, just by virtue of existing, you know, sometimes just like being embedded in a larger capitalist structure that makes you want to just get up every day, go work and become a machine. You know, a world that relegates the beautiful human experience to almost sort of machinery and clockworkness. We must protect ourselves. And in a world where racism exists, that, that highlights the ugliness in the world, we have to protect ourselves even more. And so this idea of like protecting yourself, you know, in the hood, there's this expression, that folks always say like, yo, secure the bag. You know, no matter what happens, secure the bag. Which essentially means like, you know, secure your avenue for income, right? But what if we are the bag? Like, like we, are the, we are the resource. We are the thing that has the most value. So if you're gonna secure the bag, secure you first. 
And so uh, this, this, the PPE metaphor is emerging out of recognizing the truth of who we are and then protecting the sanctity of who we are and the fact that we are portals to a more just universe if only we remain safe. So if you balance the, that notion of PPE and protecting oneself, right, and thinking about the folks who actually see art as a healer, mm -hmm. actually sees art as, to your point, you use portal, but they also see it as gateway to new understandings. Yeah. You know, what would be the one thing that you would want as they're protecting themselves from, with PPE that you would want the artists and the community folks to take from this that they should actually be doing to bring forth you know, art as healing. To, to you, like the art as the mechanism that we respond to the ills of the world, right? So for me, the way that you, the way that you retain the beauty of your art is by making your art be the vessel through which you respond to what's going on in the world. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like if there's hurt and pain in the world and we need to see beauty in it, then we need art that represents the beauty in it. And, and you know, when I talk about hurt and pain, I also have this sort of firm belief in the fact that we should not sit in and with only the pain, right? Like in the midst of COVID-19 and state sanctioned violence and racism and bias and misogyny, that all these horrific things, there's in that such beauty as well, right? There's a, um, and it's like, you know, your, your art can highlight the beauty in it. When we think about black and brown young folks in communities of color, for example, right? You know, every statistic, it's such a problematic experience and they, they exist in poverty, and, but they also exist with creativity. They, they exist with imagination. They exist with discovery. They, they exist with like ingenuity, which is the most beautiful thing. And so, if, you know, you, you, you hold on to the core self by making sure that your art highlights the beauty in the midst of the challenge, in the midst of the obstacle, show the possibilities, like in the midst of the hurt, show the joy. Um, you know, give us insight into the other part of the narrative that society is driving within us. Because if we swim only in what is problematic, if we, if we swim only in a deficit viewpoint, then we get, we get paralyzed by it and we get consumed by it. And then before long, we become a cog of the machine that produces dysfunction. So we need art to create possibility so we can step out of the machine and create a new future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, as a person that's come from sort of corporate America and understanding this notion and of glass ceilings or things that prevent us from being our best selves, right? And I think about the world of teaching artists and arts educators, et cetera, who are putting on the PPP or PEE, who are actually, you know, responsive to this notion of bringing art in this moment. You know, how do we sort of help them break through these glass ceilings or these hard walls that sort of prevent them from being the best of what they do? How, what would you say to them? What, what, what tools, what partnerships, what do they need to have in themselves to push against that? The, the first thing I would say is leave the building and let the building and let the building and those within it come to you, right? Uh, and this is not to say that we should not have our professions and our jobs and our tasks. Yes, I think those things are such a thin slice of the complexity of who you are as an art educator, right? Like, you know, I, I, one of my favorite people in the world is a, is a rap artist, a, rap, a battle rapper named Loaded Lux. And Loaded Lux had a video on his Instagram the other day, and he goes, yo, no matter what happens, I'm going to be good, because I'm always going to be doing my work. Doing your work, right? He's like, I, I, I don't have a job, but I'm always doing my work, <laughs> right? And like, I think, I think that teaching artists and art educators have to understand that, that your job is your job. Your work, your purpose is outside of the building. And it's OK to step outside of the building, even as one strand of you is doing a job. Don't get consumed by the task, get consumed by your mission, your vision, your idea of new possibilities. And what happens is inevitably, the building that creates the glass ceiling will come to you, mm -hmm. right? And then you can use the resources of the building to construct a new possibilities. I, you know, Hip Hop Ed, when I began it a couple years back, was a Twitter chat. It was me and a couple of people talking about hip hop and education and art on Twitter. And it became a nonprofit. Then it became a movement. Then it became a hashtag. Then it became a philosophy. Then it became a series of books. I wasn't pursuing a, a, a task within an institution. This had nothing to do with being a professor. It had nothing to do with any other role or task I've been given. It was about my pursuing of my mission, my vision, my purpose, and possibility. And in the pursuance of that work, everything else figured itself out. So I would say to artists, don't chase a building with a glass ceiling, when you can step out of that building and create a world with endless possibilities. 
See, I, I, I espouse and I actually totally relate to what you're saying, but just to be, you know, somewhat controversial for a second yeah, and okay. say, you yeah. know, because I just do that all the time. Um, you know, there is this sort of notion of, I, I have this desire, this wanting, this purpose that I know, right? But there's something inherent in us sometimes, and it's sort of, it's, it's kind of a little bit of fear, right? Where you, 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 and that's probably not the best word, but it's a word that pops in my head. Yeah. You know, how do we sort of give people the tools to sort of step out on what they know, right? <laughs> you gotta, you're asking them to leave the building, but there's comfort sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever that definition is and whatever it is, I, I agree and, and say, you know, step out of the business, build and do both, you know, like what, what do we think the answer is, is for those folks who are just waiting to hear the thing, right? COVID makes you want to stay in the building. Mm -hmm. um, racism makes you want to stay in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, walking down the street and, and God, you know, I, I often moved by these videos of these kids that just see police driving down the street and they just get, they, they get scared. Like all of that's happening right now and all of this. And again, I firmly believe that art is a, is a way to sort of help heal, right? But how do we help them to sort of break out of the fear or what could be perceived as fear? What might you say to them? You know, that I want to tell educators who are here who feel that way, that fear is normal. That fear is a, it's a, it's, it's a part of our common existence. Um, I'm fearful all the time. Sometimes I'll send a tweet and I'm like, oh boy, you know, I might get canceled by sharing this, but this is what's in the depth of my soul and I have to say it. And I think we have to learn to sit with the discomfort mm -hmm. um, and sit with the fear and sit, and sit with the, um, the, the wanting and the knowing. And then, and then once you sit with that stuff, recognizing like how bad can it get? And I really believe this at the core of my being. Sometimes we get so accustomed to a perception that the other side is dangerous that we don't take a leap, that, that danger is actually possibility awaiting you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, you know, I, I'm going to give a really quick, weird science story, but indulge me. So this is, this, uh, I was talking to my friend, Ron Eglash, who's a mathematician out of the University of Michigan the other day. And Ron was telling me about, how he was studying these sort of mathematical curves. And he was studying these, these sort of Benzier curves. And Benzier was this really dope dude who like was in France designing cars. You guys ever seen like Renaults or Citroëns? Like these, these cars are art, right? There's these wonderful, beautiful curves in them. And Benzier was called by the car companies. He helped to design the car and he created this amazingly beautiful curve. And since then, there's a Benzier curve named after him, right? And then he was like, man, I was engaging with these sort of like uh, indigenous folks, these sort of Native American folks, and I was realizing that they have these perfectly orchestrated and created curves in their art when they're creating wigwams or they're creating bows and arrows. And so I, I went to them and I said, guys, how did you come up with these, these curves? And they said, um, we listen to, to everyone. I said, well, he was like, well, who, who's the everyone? Who do I go listen to? And they said, go in the forest and listen to the trees. And he was like, I have no time for this foolishness. But essentially, the, the Benzier curve, a mathematical discovery, that if you listen to Benzier's autobiography, he said, I discovered the curve. I did it. It's me. You go to the indigenous populations and they say, the trees told us. We listen to the people. And what's my point in saying this? My point is in this. If you exist in a world where you want it to be about you, then you're going to be fearful of what people think of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. recognize mm -hmm. that this work is not about you, this is about a collective. Mm -hmm. If you are sitting with fear somewhere in your art classroom in Ohio and mm -hmm. Dr. Emily is sitting in New York working with Lincoln Center, we are all operating with the same divine purpose to reimagine the possibilities in the world through art. There's no space to fear when you have the world working with you. And so when it's about you, it's about fear. Mm -hmm. When it's about the collective, it's about possibility. Mm -hmm. So always remember that you're not alone because you have a collective of folks who are waiting for each of us to step out of the building mm -hmm. and do the work. And mm -hmm. once that happens, when your purpose is no longer about you, but about the young people that you work with, about the folks who are waiting for you to step out so they can join with you, then there's no space for fear. And it, don't say, it doesn't mean that we won't feel it, but there's no space for it. Right. It doesn't, it's, we, there's no space within our beings to allow it to fester. So funny because I could sit here and just like not ask these questions and just listen to you talk, but I, I guess I'm supposed supposed to be moderating here. So, um, when you think about, you know, one of the things I also think about um, 
we, we talk about, or at least my experience with Lincoln Center has been mostly about arts education and students, right? Or uh, Jean Taylor does a lot of work with arts education and college students. But it's always sort of this, this um, younger population, which is where, you know, change starts from, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what are the things that we're missing by having teaching artists or arts educators influence adults more? You know, what are we missing by, by not getting the voices of, of, of teaching artists or the experience, if you will, you know, in corporate America or in bigger arts institutions that may not be, uh, you know, proud of this work? So what, what's happening in the world? And, and is that part of the systemic problem and challenge that arts is really just showing up or, per or perceived to be showing up in, in very small places where people can impact change. You know? Oh, Allison, I love, love, love your question. I, and I know I it's try. a loaded question. I know it's a loaded, I know you know the answer to this question. You know, on occasion you connect with people who are like, you know what, Chris, here's the alley -oop. Go dunk, right? <laughs> I, so I get that's where you are and I appreciate you for it. Listen, the reason why adults are broken is because they've forgotten how to play. They've, they've forgotten how to love. They've mm -hmm. forgotten what curiosity looks and feels like. They, they've forgotten the joy of the unknown. They stopped asking questions about why the world is the way it is. And I think that we need arts educators to restore to humanity mm -hmm. a more expansive view of themselves and the world, right? Mm -hmm. Even the world and field of education people come in to be educators, then they are teachers for a while, then they want to be a principal, then they want to be a superintendent. There's this hierarchy that folks construct. And as you go up this invisible hierarchy of where you're supposed to arrive to, the process requires you taking off pieces of yourself that made you the most human, that made you the most lovable, that made you the best educator. And that in our world, you are. yes, yeah. yes. And the, 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 the task of the arts educator is to restore to humanity what they've lost in the pursuit of self. Right, to restore to the corporate, corporate person and to the principal, to the administrator, to the politician, the idea that you don't have the answers, that you are but one piece of this amazing cosmic universe that is creating a piece of art. And you're knowing and welcoming and appreciating your art in combination with everybody else's creates a new beautiful future. So yes, arts educators are not just for children. Children are the arts educators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are the art educators. Wow. Wow. They're the ones wow. who inform us on what art is and teach us our questions. Those of us who have the task of art, of art educators are simply those who are restoring what the child is teaching us to share with the world. Mm -hmm. And we should be intentional about teaching that to adults. And, you know, in my classes at TC, at Teachers College, you know, what I, what I oftentimes do is I take my students completely out of the comfort, their comfort zones for the sake of allowing them to feel again. So we go to black churches so they can learn what the Pentecostal preacher is looking like and feeling like and such. We go to barber shops. We walk street corners together. We engage in hip hop cyphers together. We paint, we draw, we do graffiti. And they say, well, Dr. Emden, what does this have to do with teaching me how to teach? And I'm saying, my job is not to teach you how to teach. My job is to teach you how to feel again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, to, how to teach you to be courageous again, how to be fearful again, how to be curious mm -hmm. again. Because if mm -hmm. you can restore back the childhood to the adult, mm -hmm. And you create new a new world for, for like where the where the adults can then have a child likeness, right? A child you, there's a beauty there's a oh, there's a beauty in there's a beauty in a childlike curiosity mm -hmm. and a childlike appreciation and the absence of apathy in the world. I don't know actually know what the system is called. Um, when but when you when you talk, I'm a very visual person. I, I see things. It's not always a great thing to be able to see what what someone's saying to you, but when you're speaking, I, I, I just came up with another systemic thing, which mm -hmm. is we keep, uh, especially in this country, we paint these very, you know, linear pathways, right? You graduate from this and you graduate from that and then you spend two years and, and God, if you're especially in the South from where I'm from, you're supposed to get married and you have a baby and, and all of those things, you said it so well that they just continue to rip across because these systems sort of force you to be narrow. Yeah. And, and so when you think about turning the light bulb on, the, on light bulb on for, you know, the teaching artist role, the, 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 
educator that is so such a powerful role Absolutely. in this world why haven't we taken care of it why haven't we cultivated this role why haven't we put it out there and put it at the same level as a technologist you know coming from tech firms you know i you know and i have a stem to steam question for you later but it's like all we talked about is how do we reinsert or, or you know put put back the create you know the creative the curiosity into our tech folks yeah but why isn't this teaching artist role as prominent I, I as, think, as something like that you know man i think we just live in a world where the blind pursuit of position has has robbed us of our humanity um and i think that we all need to engage in the pedagogy of restoration like to restore back to ourselves our core selves and I, I think that because we live in a world where that is the case, and there's no way around that, that we have to find all these, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into too, too much theory and Foucault and the Panopticon, but we, 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 you know, I, I almost bear up there and got too, geek, too geeky, so I'm going to bring it back. But we, we, have, to, we have to find these, 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 these fractures. We have to find fractures in social life that provide us opportunities for reinvention. And, and this is why, and people have looked at me like I'm crazy when I said, I'm so excited that we've had COVID-19. I said, Dr. Emin, that's a horrific thing to say. No, I am pained by the hurt. I am pained by the loss. I am excited about the potential for possibilities. For the very first time in a long time, people are realizing that, hey, wait, uh, we could have asynchronous learning where kids can wake up at 11 o'clock and still learn. What a weird concept, you know? So I think that we have to, as, as arts educators, in a world that devalues us, as educators in the world that devalues us, we have to be perpetually in search for fractures in this mold that allows us for spaces of reinvention. Mm -hmm. And I think Lincoln Center Activate is one of those opportunities. Every summer, there's like, all of a sudden, we have amazing people and artists and we all come together, we all line and we're exciting. That's a fracture. Now we have to take advantage of those moments. We can't, we can't allow it to die in that moment. So now you want to bring a link and activate to the school year. You want to bring it to a principal's institute. Yes, I said principal's institute. Why not train, train school principals and thinking of arts, right? A superintendent's workshop to look at art differently, right? You know, a local artist coming through to inform teaching and learning. In these moments where we have like a, 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 a little speck of light, Mm -hmm. Filtering through. I, I'm thinking about a Leonard Cohen song, but I'm not going to go there either. But in these little moments where a speck of light uh, is, 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 going, is coming through the darkness, mm -hmm. we got to chase the light and rip yeah. it all open. You know, and, and so, um, but I, I, at the point that it's not valued is there. The answer to why, I think, is just the structure of our society. Um, but I always rest on the possibility. Yeah, and I think we as we as sort of folks who happen to be in these prominent positions, we need to start changing the conversations. Yes. And we need to use the words of arts institutions to make this role more clear and more obvious, which is why I'm so excited about some of the things that we're trying to do at Lincoln Center, which is around internships that are really about taking folks and reinserting them in arts world, still do their business stuff, but bring them as, into this culture and into this feeling and learning different things that they want to. All right, let's, let's look at some questions that we okay. have here. So one of the first questions that came up was, you have such a beautiful way of seeing human beings in the world. How did you come to this mindset of human beings, art and being portals, especially in a society where logic and analytical thinking is the norm? We kind of we touched on that, but I, I think you can add some more there. I, you know, first of all, in the words of Maxine Green, I am who I am not yet. So I am still in the process of arriving at who I want to be. I do appreciate that comment and, uh, and, and welcome it and own it. Um, I think that where I am now is a function of being beat up a lot. And, um, and I think after being beaten up by society and society's norms, you find yourself that the beatings actually shape you into something more beautiful than you were before. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've had the beating of, you know, is this academically rigorous enough? You know, is, why is this guy at an Ivy League institution? You're a science educator. Why are you talking about art? Hip hop, how dare you talk about hip hop? Like, I, I've had, I, I came into academia as this sort of like whole thing, this being, and I got dinged a couple times, but I didn't allow the dings to topple me over. I was dinged and still stood. Mm -hmm. And I got dinged and dinged and dinged and dinged. And rather than allowing those experiences to make me break, I realized that they've shaped me. 
They've really helped me to look at the world differently. I look at folks who assault hip hop culture as so broken. How could you assault something that's created out of lack and, and this thing has become the, and I, and, I, and I start looking at them like, oh my gosh, the reason why you tried to ding me is because you've been pained by someone else. And I, I, I think being beaten up allows you, when you're beat up and you still stand, you get shaped into something stronger than you've ever been, mm -hmm. a, a, a better version of yourself. And then you, then you work to perpetually be a better version of you. And also, and also for me, I feel like my, my arriving to where I am and where I want to be is always recognizing that I'm being watched by babies. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, I work with middle schoolers and high schoolers. They, like, if you, you learn to be a better human being when you recognize that you have to model a better self for the next generation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And I've had moments in my life where I've like, literally, I, I give you a quick example. And I hope you guys don't mind if I tell you a story. So my, my daughter has, uh, she, takes, she takes ballet on Saturdays. And, um, and she takes piano, she used to take piano on Mondays. She used to take swimming on Wednesday. She had all these things. And I was giving her all these things unbeknownst to me because I never had them when I was a kid growing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So I gave her all the, her schedule was crazy. You look at my Google calendar, it was all pink because that's her favorite color. And it's all these things in pink for all the things that Sydney has to get done. And one day we go to ballet and the teacher says, Dr. Anderson, just reminding you, there's no ballet on Saturday so you guys can sleep in and you can rest. And I was like, yes. And on Saturday morning, I wake up and Sydney runs into the bedroom and says, she used to call me Papa when she was younger. Now it's all dad. But, Papa, 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 we have ballet. We're going to be late. And I look over to her and I say, Sydney, don't worry. There's no ballet today. We can sleep and go back to bed. And she says, no, you're wrong. It's Saturday. We have ballet. And she was so convincing and so compelling that I got up and I said, you know what? She's, I'm probably wrong. She's probably right. And I get her leotard on her. I put all her stuff on her. We run down the stairs. We get to the door. I'm like, and now I'm like, Sydney, we're late. Come on, let's go. And she goes, not real ballet, silly. Imaginary <laughs> ballet. Imaginary <laughs> ballet. And I was so struck. And I said, imaginary ballet. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going back to bed. And she goes, no, dad, it's imaginary ballet. Get in the car. So now I'm confused. What car? Right? Is it a real car? Is it a virtual car? Is it a... And she goes, the couch is the car. So I run over to the car. And I sit in the car. And I said, Sydney, get in. And she goes, no, dad, I'm driving. So we switch seats in the couch. And she's driving. And she turns around. And she straps me in my invisible car seat. And she starts driving. Now, this part's embarrassing. As she's driving, she winds down the imaginary window and she starts yelling at people. Where'd you get your license anyway? <laughs> Stupid red light, we're gonna be late. Oh man. And so she's saying all these things to all yeah. these invisible people. And that's when I realized Wait. I am not teaching her how to be a better human being by introducing mm -hmm. her to the art of ballet, which is an art I wish I could have learned when I was a kid. She's mm -hmm. not learning from where I'm taking her and what I'm introducing her to. She's learning about from what I am modeling. That's right. And so I am modeling frustration. I am modeling anger. I am yelling at people. And once that hit me, I realized that I have to not say things. I have to mean things. I have to model things. I arrive to where I am by recognizing that my daughter and son are watching and all those babies who I touch in Science Genius and Hip Hop Ed are watching and I have to be a better self because I have to model for them the kind of human being I want them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to think where do I go from that? I was so connecting to, to everything you were saying and I actually was reflecting on on my kids now who are college kids to let me in sometimes and they easily move me out. So, I, you know, I get in where I can fit in when it comes to them. Um, let's, let's look at another question that's come up here. So what are some practical things to get started if you're feeling confined and uncreative um, in the time of quarantine? What are some things you would suggest that people would do? I, I have no, ex I'm not expert on what things you can do. I'll tell you some things I've done and maybe okay. that can help. One, yeah. it's always, if, if we were in person, we would do this. I always think it's so beautiful to let out a guttural from the depth of your gut scream. Yeah. Every morning, we just yell. And I think when you yell, you just let out all the pain, you let out all the frustration, you let out all the angst. 
So do that when you can. One, I love to walk barefoot. I know this sounds crazy. I sound like a crazy hippie science guy. Term. Like, what is he talking about? Take off your shoes and walk in the grass. I don't mm -hmm. care if a patch of grass this big. There's something about the soles of your feet touching the earth that connects you to something so much bigger than you and censors you. So do that. I also firmly believe in affirmation. Write down who you want to be and what you want to be and say it back to yourself 20 times. I sometimes affirm in the mirror. I stand in the mirror and I, and I talk to myself and I say to myself the things I feel like I'm lacking. That's helpful, mm -hmm. right? So in the morning, you know, if I'm feeling particularly unattractive one day, you know, you know, I haven't seen my barber in a while. <laughs> I, I go in the mirror and I say, Chris Emden, you sexy, handsome, black <laughs> devil you. Right? So I say to me the things I need from me to help me feel more whole. And I think mm -hmm. that un, uh, affirmations are so understated or under-focused upon to help us be a more full self. Mm -hmm. um, pedagogically, I think this happens, we need to do this in the classroom as well. So affirmations are important in the classroom. Uh, guttural screams and play before we do the task are important mm -hmm. for young folks to let out their angst. Uh, I'm a firm believer in cogenerative dialogue. So, just having conversations with young people, not about what you want to teach, but about how they're receiving what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. um, that censors you and grounds you and makes you better. So those are a few personal strategies and pedagogical strategies that I use. I, I love that's this helpful. Notion. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry. I, I love this notion of affirmations because yeah. I think the affirmations in some respects um, balance the judgment, right? And, and by the way, we are, we are our worst judges like we judge ourselves we we often wonder how we sound there was something you said on monday when you said i'm not gonna you you're making a reference to changing the way you speak and you're not going to do that because this is the way you speak and when i i remember uh coaching somebody once and she was um from india and she um you she she was really highly regarded in her role and but whenever she would speak she would think about what people need to hear and other for, in order for her to make her point. Yeah. And people often gave her negative feedback around the way she was communicating. And so one time I just, I just said to her, I said, why don't you just talk? Yeah. And if they can't understand, they should ask clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. But you, when you're sitting there modifying who you are, you're not bringing your full self to the experience and people are missing out on what you're trying to say. It, it, um, the this, that's so brilliant. I just have to. I know there's more questions, but I always say to folks who are like, you're not them, then how do you get to be this mind, like mindful and aware and conscious? And I say, you're most mindful when your mind's not full. And mind being full of other folks' expectations, other folks' norms, other folks' yeah. rules of engagement. You cannot be fully aware and in touch if your mind is full with everybody else's notions and versions of you. And I, I, when I talk with, I'm so glad you mentioned your, your uh, mentee from India, because I, when I work with my, my, uh, my international students, that's oftentimes the thing I have to work on with them the most. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you another quick story. I'm full of stories. <laughs> I had a student once, because I think, I think storytelling is, is the portal to the soul and a way to explain anything. Mm -hmm. I had a student once who was registered for my course and never said anything. And I'm, I'm very big on having all my students engage with me. And so I looked on the roster and I said, oh, wow, his name is, his name is Fnu. Because it just said FNU. So I said, oh, he might come from a place where there's no last name. So I'm like, no, you share your thoughts. And he'd always be timid and shy and wouldn't say anything. And we went all the way through the end of the semester. And at the end of the semester, he said, Dr. Ennen, thank you so much for always calling on me and, and for making me step out. And I said, no worries. That's what I'm here for. And he said, but I have to tell you one thing. I said, what's that? He said, Dr. Emden, my name's not Fnu. <laughs> and I said, but, but that's what it says on the roster. It says FNU, FNU. He said, no, it, 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 FNU actually stands for first name unknown. Right. Where I come from, there's no first name. So that's why it said FNU on the roster. And, and what it said to me was, he spent the entire semester wow. not being called by his name. And he was okay with that and thankful to me. He was thankful to me for calling him not by his name for an academic year. The kind of violence we do to our spirits when we give other folks the permission to affirm us. That's right. That's right. And I think that that to me is like, um, that's, that's one of these magical opportunities with art, 
right? And yeah. it's, you know, I think, I think we, we, and I, and I don't want to speak as, as though I'm truly knowledgeable of everything because I'm still learning. I'm sort of nine, nine months in this new world, but, um, you know, I feel like there's been, uh, in some respects, a very ro robotic answer around arts education. And I, I hope that's okay to say, and I'm not going to get some nasty grounds, but it's, and what do I mean by that? We go into schools, we do this thing, we take the art and all, and the pedagogy is, is amazing, but it's like, how do we actually use it to do more? Like, I love talking to Jean about this because she'll say, she'll reference creative thinking and problem solving, but I would go farther and say, wouldn't it have been great for him to know that at the end of that class, or even in the moment, to say, doctor, um, kind of not my name, right? Yes. And there's a, there's a space in which there's, arts can play a role in empowering people to have voice. And, and, and I think we need to figure out as a community, as a, you know, we talk so much about the social and the systemic, but there's opportunities to change humans yes. so that they're more empowered to be fully who they are. Wow. I don't know where your reaction is. No, yes, yes, all of it, all of what you said. Even the part where you thought you'd get dinged. I agree with that part too. I think, I think that arts education has been so colonized in a way, in, in a way that makes it not artistic. Right? It's like, wait, this is arts education. We don't have to fit arts education into this mold of what yeah. folks think curriculum and pedagogy and look like, and you know, what are your art standards and what is your art rubric? I'm like, what in the world are you doing? Do not right. take this thing that is bigger than all of it and try to confine it into everybody else's speak and talk. So yes. And I think the thing about art for me is that it is a chief mechanism for folks to find themselves. Yes. Once yes. you find your artistic self, once you recognize that you are art, you operate in the world differently. Something in your, something in your, your shoulders go back, your heads go up, there's something in it. I mean, my, my modes of artistic expression is dance. I've always loved dance and I've always loved music in particular hip hop. And listen, get me in a hip hop cypher and my, my, I light up. I, you know, I've been in hip hop cyphers before where it's like, I feel like my feet leave the ground. I feel like I'm such a bigger person than my body. And I think if everybody got to feel that once, if every young person got to feel like they were bigger than their body, that they had more to contribute to the world than this shell could contain, mm -hmm. they could pursue anything they want. And I want to also uh, identify the fact that being an arts educator, the path of art, it's not, it's not just to create artists, because we are all artists. That's right. We are all artists. There's a Fortune 500 math whiz somewhere who yeah. sees art in those numbers. And how do we help that person to reveal the artist within them, right? Mm -hmm. And that our work is to implant into the collective consciousness that we are all artists and we all have different mediums or media through which we express that artistic self. Do you think that there's like, you know, in this sort of underpinning, and I know we've got like another 20 minutes, so, so hang in there. I won't keep throwing questions Not at you, worry. but I, I'm loving this conversation and I feel like, okay, this is just you and I talking. But um, in, in, in the structures <laughs> and the systems that, that is, um, forget about, I mean, period, in, in multiple countries, not just the United States, but there's so many structures. We just talked about the, the family one in which you're sort of ingrained very early on what the pathways are. We, we can talk about the, the faith ones that, you know, growing, I got, I can't even tell you, I grew up as a, a, a Christian and there were so many weaves into that. And, you know, I, I you know, it's like everything has these structures. Yeah. Do you think in some respects the biggest opportunity, and I kind of love your, your frame around COVID and its moment and its time, you know, I, I feel like it has leveled a lot of things, yeah. right? And so the only way is up and, and opportunity to sort of, de, you know, dishevel these, some of these structures and systems. Do you think art itself, you know, plays across so many things, oh, yeah. right? It's not just the slice of like, you know, math. And, and, I, and I, this kind of leads me to the STEM versus theme question, yeah. right? Which we, tr we try to put acronyms around things, we try to marry things. Yep. And I think often that's really ab about the moment or what people think are missing. So some brilliant person in the corner says, well, let's just call it theme and, you know, then it'll include art. Yep. Um, but do you think it's, it's not that it runs sort of you know, vertical, is that right? Like, like you know, sort of functional. It yeah. kind of like shows up everywhere. It is so everywhere. Is, the, is the teaching artist really 
the teacher, like in everything. Like it's like you almost have a certification of teaching artistry before you can actually teach any of our students in, in my, the world. In, my per in my perfect world, every classroom will have a content expert and artist working together to help reveal the art in the student and the art in the content. And it, 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 you know, teaching artists are, are, are magicians because they unlock human potential. And in particular content areas in particular, so this is me and my STEM STEAM thing, right? In particular content areas, the nature of the structure of the disciplines is so confining that you need to unlock the self first before you can even get to the discipline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this is a STEM STEAM argument. And I get it, like, when folks say like STEAM, like it's an afterthought, no, it, 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 it may have been framed by some folks as an afterthought. I think of the arts at the, as the anchor. It sits in the middle of it because right. it holds it all together. There would be no steam if the arts couldn't hold it all together. And it is both the subject matters and beyond the subject matters. It sits in it and then beyond it. Um, I have a book I'm working on now, if it ever gets done. The title is STEM Steam Make Dream. And the mm -hmm. idea is that STEM in itself is problematic. It needs the arts to hold it together. But even beyond the arts, we need the art to be able to, you have to make something, you have to create, it's about creation. And then it's about dreaming. And if we, if we, if we, if our pedagogy was anchored in making and dreaming, mm -hmm. we wouldn't even have begun with STEM to begin with, because mm -hmm. that would have been a part of what the artistic enterprise was anyway. Mm -hmm. How many of us have seen a brilliant jazz musician and you just say, oh my God, like, well, maybe it's just me as a science geek, right? And I just say, oh my gosh. Yeah. The ratio and proportion to lows and highs in that solo was crazy. Did anybody else know? Like, I, I, I literally can see the math and the artistic expression. Mm -hmm. And I talk to these folks, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I just played. And I'm like, you didn't, you didn't just play, you science with you, right? Or, or, or watch the grace in a ballet dancer, and you might, or you're like, oh my gosh, you just defied and defined centripetal motion of physics, right? <laughs> or you see this work of art and you're like, oh my gosh, I see inverse square law, I see fractals, I, see, you know, and, and so the fact that many of the people who are in STEM are, they, they, they don't, they haven't even, they don't have the beauty of seeing the art and what they do. How sad, how sad that they can't see the art in the magic of what they do. And, I, I make the argument that part of the ego of the scientist and mathematician and the mm -hmm. engineer mm -hmm. is because they because they have they've lost their humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, ego, ego and human and, and sort of humanity are there in this like this this always this fight this battle. Once you have ego, you lose your belief in other people. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you go into where like, oh, you're a scientist, you're super smart, like, oh, that's right. I am super smart. I am awesome. I am great. Ah, then I don't care about feelings. But if you have feelings compiled with your knowledge, you see the world completely differently. Mm -hmm. I think of art as sort of this all-encompassing thing, right? And and it, to your point, it's it's the thing that's the wrapper around steam, right? Yeah. But what do you say to folks who, and I'm sure there's no one on this call who feels that way, but what do you say for folks who see it as soft? It's soft, you know? Or you can't make money in it. Or, you know, it's associated with inserting our, like, oh, let's look at what the government did to arts budgets years ago. They don't really care about it. So, you know, what do you, what do you think? Because as you were talking about the, the sort of reverence that we give to science, technology, you know, engineering and math, right? And we have to, you know, somebody, somebody, you maybe, squeezed in the A and said it's the wrapper, it's the connector, right? But folks still see it as soft. You have moms that are, like maniacal about you are STEM, you are still, you will be STEM, you will, do, you know, and the poor kid, like I think about my kid who um, had a father and I guess into some extent he's really good at math, he's really great at science. And so we just, we label him, we just mm -hmm. theme, you know? And now he's like, you know, turned into this like, you know, his wall, entire wall is covered with art. He, he's missing social connections with people. He now wants to be a psychiatrist and a therapist so he can unpack the mind. And, you know, he, he got there in his own way. But what do you say about the, those folks who are just like, it's, it's, it's art. So it's like, it's soft. I say, look at, the world, look at the world and where we are. And, and, and are you okay with the world as it is? 
Mm. And I would say that right. I would say I would I would say look at the world and the way it is, and are you okay with it as it is? Because the reason why we have folks with a lack of soul, a lack of joy, a lack of passion, a lack of creativity, a lack of innovation, a lack of a lack of uh, of, of multiple worldview is because we have devalued what art is. And uh, to me, like art is like, it's like the slowing down of time mm. to see the beauty in each moment, right? It's mm. like, you know, if you could just if you could just right and, and you just and bring things down to the cellular level right and then i can look up right now and see specks of dust floating in this light and just appreciate slowing down time to see the beauty in everything right and if we looked at everything in the world through that lens we'd be better off right right and i think listen one thing that we know right now is we, we have scientists and mathematicians in the united states who've got all the credentials in the world who lack all the creativity all the imagination all they could do is replicate what they've seen from other people that's not science or math. So if you think it's soft, you know, I think that I don't, I don't want to run away from the idea that it's soft. I want to fully embrace that it's soft mm -hmm. because you need soft for mm -hmm. it to feel good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to say like, but you know, but art is rigorous. Yeah, we know that art can be rigorous. Everything is rigorous. We pay enough attention to it. I want us to embrace, I, you know what? The arts are soft and there's mm -hmm. beauty in the softness. There's beauty in the, in the, in, a, in a pillowy goodness of soaking yeah. into something that can wrap around you and hold you and make you feel good. And so, you know, I, I gave a talk a couple years back at the camp uh, at Stanford. And after the talk, I, it was me and I brought uh, uh, Jizza from Wu-Tang because I'm, the, you know, this hip hop thing. And this woman came up to me after the talk, college student says, Dr. E, this is, this is so great. This is the first time I saw the techies and the fuzzies together. And I said, <laughs> what do you mean? And apparently on that campus, there's a, there's a techie side and a fuzzy side, and never the twain shall meet. It got so bad that they had to like put buildings on different sides so that they could connect to each other. And I think for us to be human beings, we need some hardness and we need some softness. Mm -hmm. And the combination of the two makes magic. That's right. Okay, let's get another question because I, I have a feeling there's so many and I want to make sure that we get a lot of these done. So do you think that implementing um, uh, a set aside time for sort of transcendental um, meditation or quiet time and activities, as long as, you know, t you know, students are actually being taught and they're, and they're getting the lesson. Do you think making sense, making time for sort of meditation in the classroom or even outside of it, even if it's like 10, 15 minutes, um, is the groundwork to, to some of the things that you're actually describing? Yeah, I think I, so I'm going to get really layered here. I think that we all must make time individually and collectively to reconnect and restore. I do also think that there are different paths to reconnection and higher consciousness among different people based on who they are and where they're from. Mm -hmm. So I think that some folks need a moment of silence and quiet for their personal stuff. Um, I also know that getting to a level of really being open to learn for some folks actually doesn't come from silence. It comes from noise. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, I think that you need to give folks equal opportunities at both practices so that it's okay to, in the class, have those, take out those two or three minutes or five minutes for kids to center and focus and recognize where they are and then equally give space for them to be able to, lot, to be loud and ratchet and turn up. Um, and again, this also comes back to me for the hip hop cypher. I've never seen, so in a world where black men in particular perform hypermasculinity and, and, um, and perform, you know, I've got it all together and an absence of connection, the only times in recent history that I've seen brothers, I'm, th I'm talking brothers from the hood, really like fully embrace each other and love each other and look into each other's eyes with this beautiful softness has been in hip hop ciphers. And I think that the hip hop cipher should be a structure in every classroom. And in the cipher, mm -hmm. they stand equidistant from each other. And one person performs and the next, next person performs and there's music and rhythms in the backdrop, almost, almost an ancestral boom bap in the backdrop. And before long, they're finishing each other's sentences. And then before long, their arms on each other's shoulders and they're looking into each other's eyes and they're, they're mouthing each other's sentences. And there's this sort of vulnerability and softness and humanity that came out of this process of noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need good quiet and good noise. Yes. Right? Yes. To, to make good connection. Yes. Okay, 
one more, actually two more questions, because I, I really want to make sure that um, these are all good. So I, I really I even suggested to the team that we figure out a way to get you to respond to some of these, and maybe we okay. can send them out as part of a follow-up. Um, how, how, in those situations where, you know, some of the teaching artists, you know, they're so passionate about this work, um, but are in those, in those structures, right? You know, and don't necessarily, or may not want to necessarily step out, you know? Mm -hmm. What, what could they do? Like, how could they convince people to get on board or, or the folks that are making key decisions, especially around budgets and um, resources? What, what could they say? What, what might be a, like two or three points that you would give on that? Well, I, I will say this to, to my arts educators, you know, you know, in order to be able to have sustenance, <laughs> right? It is oftentimes important to adopt the discourse of power to justify what is revolutionary. It's not selling out, it's not co-option. It is recognizing that what I have to offer is so essential to everyone that, under, that I can frame it through the lens of what they say is important so I can get to young people and do important work. Um, I don't know if I shared this example when we spoke last you know, about, about recommending the hip hop cypher, right? And then I had to change it up. I had to say, oh, it's metacognition and reflection. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if the discourse of power is calling for metacognition and reflection, I'm saying I want to have young folks gather together in Socratic circles to engage in metacognitive practices so they can have deep reflection, because that's what you guys say that you want. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing that through violin. I'm doing that through ballet. I'm doing that through dance and jazz. I think, you know, a lot of the people who are advocating for things don't know what they're advocating, what it looks like to advocate for what they want. I, I give it like. They, 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 they want kids to be reflective, but they don't know what reflection looks like. So it's up to the arts educators to articulate for them what it looks like, but sometimes you might have to use their language to describe it, right? Um, a lot of folks are demanding things from teachers and don't know what they want. So you have to tell them what they want in their own language. Um, so I think that's really important. I also think that it's important for you to be, you know, art, art and activism are one and the same. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't be an artist and be silent about your work and what it means and what, and so, you know, even as we work within systems, we also have to advocate outside of systems for allowing our voice to be heard. Um, and, and so I think part of your work also is not making it individual, but if you're working and you feel like though arts need to have more voice, write a letter. I, I write a letter. There's, there's certain folks in New York State government, they're like, oh boy, here comes them again. I write letters bi-weekly <laughs> to advocate for more, a more expansive view of arts and education and a reimagining of STEM. I think we all need to be able to do that activist work as well, even as we argue for the work we need to do for sustenance. That's, a, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I would love to understand, I think there's some folks on the call who would actually, you know, this notion of professionalizing this work, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when you think about professionalizing this work, um, uh, there are some teaching artists who disagree with that. Yeah. You know, and, and don't, and, and think maybe in some respects you might lose something as a result of it. Like, yeah. what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? So, I get it. Listen, so here I am advocating for arts and innovation and creativity with a lot of degrees. <laughs> and, and I'll say something like that's seemingly radical, but I'll say it anyway. What I've known is right to do when it comes to teaching young folks, I knew before I had a master's and a master's, master's, and a, I knew it. I knew what was right to do. I did not have the platform, the avenue, the space to be able to speak truth to power in the way that I wanted to. And I feel like the degree and the credential affords me a platform to speak truth to power in a way I could have from the other platform. I say that to say this. Deep, like, I understand that we don't need to have to bend to these norms to be valued. I am a, I am a, I know what I have to offer. But I also think that some of us have to understand that for us to be able to infiltrate spaces and create new possibilities, some of us must do it. Now, that is not for all of us. Do not step into a zone that is not your calling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some of us know that masses is calling you, bro. 
that doctorate is calling you, that credential is calling you, that certification is calling you. You know that it helps you to get to where you don't fight your calling, is all I'm saying. And some of us are called to work within institutions. Some of us are called to work outside of institutions. Some of us are called to infiltrate institutions. Some of us are called to burn down institutions. We mm -hmm. all must operate in our purpose in order to allow the work to be what it's supposed to be. So if your soul is saying, don't get the credential, don't get it. But if you listen in the quiet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in your meditation time and period, yes. something sometimes tells you to go get that credential. I want to give a shout out to uh, Darrell. I know Darrell is on here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blow him all the way up. He's a, it's a LCE alum and I know he's on here. Darrell is pursuing his doctorate right now at NYU doing what I would call revolutionary work in arts education in the pursuit of the PhD. It can be done. Mm -hmm. So walk and operate in your calling, but if it calls, if something's calling you to get the credential, follow that calling because you don't know what your path is and you don't know what your purpose is in this work. Do you think you need the credentials? Nah, I don't think you need it. I think, I think it helps. Mm -hmm. If I said it didn't help, I'd be lying to you, right? <laughs> Listen, the, you know, the Chris Emden PhD is talking to Allison Allen. <laughs> right? Like the chief, the chief people officer at Lincoln Center, right? You know, <laughs> if that, the, the, the credential and the platform allows me the opportunity. If I said it did not allow me the opportunity, I would be lying, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be honest with the fact that it allows us the platform. Here's the thing. I think that what happens oftentimes is that people pursue the credential yeah. and then lose themselves on the journey. And some folks sit on the outside and say, I would never want to do that because look at that person. I saw them. I knew who they were. Now mm -hmm. look at them now with a job and a PhD and a master's and look how they've lost themselves. And so the exemplars for what it looks like to have the credential are oftentimes so problematic. And I think it's up to us to have a new cadre of folks who gain the credential and retain our authenticity. And I think that if you look at that credential and saying it's problematic because I saw those people who are so awful and have sold out, well, you go ahead and follow your purpose and get that credential and model what it looks like to be different. Mm -hmm. And so, listen, it affords you opportunity. It affords you a platform. Don't chase it if it's not your calling. If you do get it, get it and be real. Mm -hmm. Get it and be authentic. Get it and speak truth to power. Get it and advocate. Get it and be truthful. Get it and be you. Get it and speak from your soul at every opportunity, whether two or 2,000. Have your heart from the bottom of your feet to the soles again. Like the, all of you, let all of you speak your truth with a credential, and then you can't be stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for somebody who's teetering on the sidelines saying, I don't know if I want to get the credential or the certification or the whatever else it is, you don't have to be like everybody else who got it. Mm -hmm. You can get it and be fire and be mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you know, then, 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 then we're all better served. I think the net net there is, um, is look for the, the, the thing, the experience that's going to open the door. Oh yeah. You know, cause sometimes all we really need is the, the, the two minutes, the three minutes, the five minutes to prove the point. You know, and, and we can get there, you know, through the credentials. And sometimes we get there through our networks. And that would be the other thing I would say that's a compliment to this, right? If you, if you believe in the purpose and you believe in the work, you're not waiting for somebody to knock on the door. You are looking for those avenues and the access and the credentials and the networks and relationships are ways in which to build that. My dear sister, you said a word just now. That, like, we all need to stop. No, seriously, stop and soak that in. Because I think some folks don't have to get a credential because they got the connections. <laughs> some folks, and, and some folks are not afforded the opportunity to have those social networks. And so you, may, you need that to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all have to understand who we are and where we are and operate with truth and recognize where we are and make moves that allow us to be our best selves. Mm -hmm. But I love that. And I think um, that, 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 that idea of networking is so important for artists. Mm -hmm. I think that artists oftentimes exist in a world where they're so committed to their arts and their art and the performing or the creating of that art that they that there's there's a certain like there's a certain like seductiveness in being a recluse, right? Like there's certain like, you know, I love my art so much I have no friends. 
<laughs> I talk to no one. You know, that's like, and and I think that while while that may be part of your process in the production of the art, we all have to develop the opportunity to be able to engage with other folks who can champion the art. And so it's part of our collective work to be social human beings. Humans are social by nature. Mm -hmm. And if you need to be on your own to create and to do and to make, do that. But you also have to be able to understand how to be able to let your work touch people and you are your work. Mm -hmm. the, art is the, art, the product is your work and you are the work. I want us to get back to the idea of you are art. And if mm -hmm. you are art, you must touch people. And sometimes mm -hmm. you being art touching people means physically being proximity to people. You know, six, right. feet of, six feet, of course, with a mask, but be in the same space as adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, I think that matters a great deal as well. You know, it's interesting. There, there, I was sitting here listening to you, and, and I just want to give you, like, you know, I want to give you four words, and mm -hmm. I want you to tell me how art connects them all, mm -hmm. right? So you've got the educator. Yeah. You've got the um, advocate. You've got the ad you've got the disruptor. Yeah. Right? And you've got the activists. Yeah. And there's a difference between all of them, at least my experience says that they are. But what is it about art that actually connects them all? And if you are doing this work today, do you need to be a little bit of all of them so that you can flex to the moment? Thoughts on that? Wow, that's such a brilliant question. I, you know, I'll say the, the reason why art connects across all those beings and those things is because art is the language of the soul. It is, it is the way to articulate what the soul is feeling, no matter what the art is. So it's like, if I'm an activist, you know, the art I create, the physical art I create, or my construction of self as artist, it, it, gets, it, gets, it, gets, it gets translated to the public through through the art, like art is the language. Art is the, uh, maybe even language, maybe language is too vernacular. I think it's art is the, it, it's the, it's the, it's the communicator, right? It's the thing that allows us all, it's not just language, it's the communicator. It's the thing that touches and, 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 and gets in the soul and gets, and gets the attention, right? So the art is the mechanism through which all of who we are gets communicated to the world. Um, so, so like that, that's what the arts is for me. I also think that art is as much a subject as it is a way of knowing, a way of being, mm -hmm. but also a way, of, a way of viewing the world. I think some folks look at the world through that lens of art, right? They, they see the beauty and the magic and the connections and things. And I think that if we all learn to look at the world, look at the world like a child, which is to look at the world like an artist, <laughs> um, then, uh, then we see things and make connections that wouldn't happen otherwise. I think if you're taking responsibility for, for driving change and purpose, then you, as an artist, and I'd love for you to, to tell me why this doesn't work, you're, you're kind of matching one of those four types for the moment so that you Absolutely. can impact change, right? Do you, think that, do you think a lot of our teaching artists and educators do that? Like no, you know, that we don't. We don't. I, th I don't think we do that enough. I think we pigeonhole ourselves. And we say, yeah, no, I'm I, just I was a... thinking about the, the questions that I see here around how do I change the, the, the thinking at the schools? How do I change, you know, mm -hmm. the folks that I work with? How do I make more space for this, for this mm -hmm. moment? And, and if you're driving in your purpose or living in your purpose, you're almost matching the moment to what's needed at Absolutely. the time. I, I don't and, know, but... I'd no, you're right. Know. You're, you're on, and it's all within you. And that is the thing. Like, once you're fully whole... And, and all the rights that we talked about earlier this week, where you're working on giving yourself the rights of the body, once you are fully whole and you're operating within those rights, you will find that the you that you need to be emerges based on the circumstances that you're in, that you're in right? Like, so, so you're not, we are not, you know, we, all, we sell ourselves short so much, Alice. We do. Me. We oh do. my gosh. We do. You know, I, you know, people, you know, I'm like, you know, oh, Dr. Emily, I can, I'm just a, just a what? Once you say you're just a, you become just a. No one is just to anything. We are all, all of us, right? And so it's like, you know, you know, we sell ourselves short. We are all of it. When we are fully whole, we become who we need to be, when we need to be, where we need to be. And, and when you, you said this word responsibility, which I love, and I, this is really Kelly Oliver, who's a post-colonial theorist, who says, you know, responsibility is not responsibility unless you enact a responsibility, mm -hmm. right? So like you could hold responsibility in your head, like, oh, I have a responsibility to do things, I have a responsibility. But if you're not enacting a responsibility, like literally 
able to respond to a phenomenon, then you're betraying the responsibilities that you have on you. And so, like, you know, we all have to have a responsibility to be our best selves and then enact a responsibility based on the circumstances that we are in. And those circumstances might call for activists, might call for, for educator, might call for advocate, but we are all of that all in one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You must be um, recognizing that we are going a little bit past that 20 oh, minutes. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. And that's because, no, 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 because we actually did have the additional time. Um, okay. So thankful for someone saying, wait, I thought this was going to five because I was like, oh, yes. Um, okay, let's, let's take a question. So my, what might be some important resources one could read to reaffirm the power of the art? Um, the aesthetic experience as an administrator. Maxine Green has ex inspired my work, and who else? Who else should people be reading? Oh God! Well, you know, I, I think everyone who knows me knows how how much in love I am with Maxine Green. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, Maxine Green is everything in, to me. I, I, I mean, as far as theory, but also practice, uh, the focus on the imagination, the focus on creativity, and also the willingness to be on the outs. Right, the willingness to be on the outs within your institution, within the structure, and which, by the way, I think is a philosophy. That you're oh man, like, yeah. you got to be comfortable. <laughs> you got to be comfortable not being loved. Here's the thing: I was right. like, folks are always gonna hate on you, That's but, right. if there's, but if but if there's purpose in it, you're, the, the the love always overpowers the hate. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, you know, you you're gonna get the emails and the tweets and the whatever and the you know, you know, every, everybody's in their feelings about certain things that you're doing. That, that's, that's par for the course. In fact, I would argue if don't nobody ever come for you, you might not be doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Oh yeah. my God, I wish I, I, I wish I was able to multitask right now because I'd be tweeting half the things you're saying right now, but that is so true. It yeah. is so true. I'm you know, sorry. so yeah. it's, it's par for the course and you can't get distracted by the critique. You can, you can be informed by the critique, or you can, or you can understand, you see, discernment is key. You, gotta, you can operate with a discernment so you can identify if it's honest critique or if it's just hate. Mm -hmm. And if you operate with discernment and true purpose, you can distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. And what I do is, you know, if it's honest critique, I reflect on it and say, wow, Chris, how can I be better? Because that struck me in a place, like if, I, if you're reactive, like well, if it jars you, probably has some truth in it. Oh my gosh, what, what, what is that? And then some of it is just frivolous. And then you guys be like, all right, it's all good. Um, and, and direct uh, response to the question about things you can do. I don't think it's always things that you read. I mean, read Maxine Green, if ever, and anytime that you can. Um, you know, I, I'm a, I have certain folks that I read just because of my world and like my science, neuroscience-ish kind of work. Like I love Francisco Varela, anything that he writes, and he writes beautifully about art and ethics and wisdom and cognition. I, I love that stuff, um, but you know, I think reading is good. I think being is better. That's not really crazy. I, I, um, I read when I'm compelled to read. I don't read when I'm forced to read. Mm. I think sometimes when people give you lists, thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to read everything on the list. I have to read everything on the list. And the, 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 and the words don't speak to you. Right. Um, so for me, it's like being. And so you know, being in the world, slowing down time and looking for the beauty in things is how I, you know, I, I, how I operate. Like, so I, I speak fast, but I listen slow. I don't know. If, if that makes sense to anyone, right? No, totally. Um, yeah, so I, I, when, I, when I speak, I'm flowing because it's, a, it's a, oftentimes a stream of consciousness. But when I'm listening to people, I am mm -hmm. slowing down their words to understand the mm -hmm. beauty in them mm -hmm. and what they have to share. Yeah. And I think one of my ways of finding beauty in art in the world is speaking fast and listening slow. Um, I listen slow to babies, to children. Mm -hmm. I listen slowly to children. Um, mm -hmm. I listen slowly to elders. Mm. I, think, I think anybody who does not have a good four-year-old or a good 80-year-old in their life is missing the most sage wisdom to can inform them ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I got, I got friends my age and I kick it with folks, you know, I mean, I got, you know, me and Gene is mad cool, you know, Allison and I are forging his relationship. <laughs> and, but man, you know, I, I, I go hang out with my pops and his OGs, mm -hmm. I get the most sage wisdom, and I and I get the most appreciation for art from old from from older folks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they 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 humble you and they make you listen. Yes, and I think you know that that's my biggest mechanism. I you know speak fast and speak from the soul, but listen slow. 
So you're a big fan of Maxine Green, and some folks on the on the call um, on this on this session may or may not know who she is. Yeah, yeah. But and I and I think you your your suggestion that at reading the book I think is exactly the right suggestion. Just reading up on her in general and anything you can find on Google is always amazing. Um, but what do you say to the folks who say pedagogy is kind of like dated, dated, and you know why? Yeah. Why are we following this person who's no longer yeah. around? And you know, and you know, uh, you know, mm, yeah. Like, what do you say to those folks? Yeah, I, you know, I, I always say like. I, I never told a lot of people my, my my first relationship with Maxine Green. I was like, who is this old lady, and what's she going <laughs> to teach me? <laughs> that was our first introduction, right? And I think that, that I think certain wisdom, wisdom, wisdom is timeless. Mm -hmm. I don't think Maxine was about uh, most from her was not about her like things to do. It's about her her wisdom, how wise she was, how mm -hmm. you know, I, you know how a conversation with her allowed me to look at hip hop differently. You know what I mean? Yeah. Her willingness to listen, you know, to I think Dipset. I actually feel so terrible because I had her listening to Dipset, and I, I say to myself, "Man, I, when I when I go back and say who do I have, who what hip hop artists that I have Maxine Green listening to, I probably made the wrong choice with Dipset. I could have picked so many other folks, <laughs> but but I think for Maxine and for those those folks like Paulo Freire, Maxine mm -hmm. Green, uh, a contemporary hero of mine, Gloria Latson Billings." Mm -hmm. um, what they offer us is not instruction, it's prescription, right? It's wisdom that heals mm -hmm. in the time. And I, and I make, you know, I, I think if people listen to Maxine, when Maxine was saying what Maxine was saying, we wouldn't be where we were right now, right? Um, and, and so for me, it's like, wisdom is never dated. You know what I mean? You know, it's like uh, certain things don't go out of style. They all, they all, they're always staples. You know what I mean? People mm -hmm. ask about I love hats, right? Hats never get played out, you know? You know, it's like certain things, th certain things is they never got, Maxine Green never goes out of style, man. That's right. Yeah. And that's actually what most of the comments have been as you've been talking about this. Um, so many of our students are now living um, in, within limited spaces in their home um, that make them feel, you know, sedentary and, you know, and even, um, you know, closed off and isolated, yeah. right? Um, yeah. um, how can we motivate them? You know, I even think about my son, like I, I can barely get him out of his room yeah. and unless I'm not in the living room. Uh, yeah. But how, how do we, how can we better motivate them physically to move their bodies and to be creative? Um, yeah. You know, I, whatever, whatever we want to say about this moment with COVID, you know, immediately moving kids from social connections to online learning with no sort of real training hasn't mm -hmm. always worked. Yeah. But, but how do we sort of motivate them to be more creative now? I think that we have to be super creative with young folks in this moment and use every single tool at our disposal to connect to them, to step them out of where they are. So what do I mean? Social media, asynchronous video. I'm gonna say something really, like people are gonna be like, what did you just say? Mail. Write a young person a letter through U.S. mail, right? There you go. Um, yeah. Call them, tweet them, instant message them. I think that, you know, it's not about young folks not wanting to be out and connect. It's about us not embedding them in spaces where they're connect, like where there's an avenue for connection. Yeah. Um, and it's not what you're telling, like, it's not what you're telling them, it's how you're telling them. It. Like, you know, if you tell me in a way that speaks to me that you want me to step out, I'll step out. But if your way of saying it is like a nag and it's like, you must, you need to. Nobody want to hear what they must and need to. They want to hear, they, they want to see that it matters to you. Send a picture to a young person of yourself outside moving. And they're like, oh my gosh, what is this person doing? I'm, I'm going to try that. So it's like, you know, I, I don't think there's one way. I think there's every way. I think use every platform and avenue possible to deliver the message that they are not alone in this time and that you are with them in this time. And that's the way to do it. And I, you know, for me, you know, young folks who confine themselves to rooms or confine themselves to apartment buildings have the most vivid imaginations. I think it's not about having them join us in our world. Sometimes it's about us at like us being close enough to them so they can invite our, us into theirs. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, if I want if I want this young person to step out this room. You know what I want to say to that young person is like, listen, like I see the art on your wall. I just want to like I want to understand that. 
I don't want you to come out. Is it okay if I come in? Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm the willingness to step out, but there's more of a willingness to allow somebody else in and sit That's in right. and flip them in the world they've constructed. That's right. Yeah. All right, so let's look. Um, how do we better foster an environment where learning to play music, become an artist at a young age is considered cool, right? Um, these can be such, um, there could be people, kids can actually be really discouraged to not stick with learning, especially if they give up, right? And how do we sort of like continue to foster this, this environment at home, not just, I mean, we're putting a lot of pressure on the teaching artists and the educators, but what can, what can parents and, and other artists be doing to sort of support kids through these, through these changes? Less is more about what you have to do, and then more and more is more in what you're exposed to. I don't know if that makes sense, right? Guys? So less is more in what you have to do, and more and more is more in what you're exposed to, right? Mm -hmm. So with my daughter, part of the, the, the story also was after she had ballet and swim and piano and this and that and that, she didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. She six and was like, I don't want to swim. I don't want to dance. <laughs> I, I, she, just, she just refused. And I was like, oh my gosh, how could you? I wish I had this when I was younger. And do the same and, thing, do the same thing, yep. And, and, and because I didn't realize that less is more as far as what you have to do, right? But more and more is what you're exposed to. So now I've learned, okay, you know what? We're gonna go horseback riding, random. And, and then we're gonna, we're gonna play on the triangle. And then we're gonna, we, so I'm, it's, it's, it's less about having you do really well at these things I think are good for you and more about exposing to you to as many things as possible and then allowing you to say, you know what? I want to do horseback riding one more time. I think I'll try it a third time. And then all of a sudden, allow, you have to allow a child to dictate to you what it is that their calling is. That's right. Otherwise, you might stamp out a desire for what actually is their gift. And that's the most dangerous thing wow. ever. Wow. Yeah. Right? Which I think is the message for, again, for these people who are using outside pressures or perceptions to shape what their kids should become. Yeah. It's a lot like how many kids have we sort of stifled from, from having, you know, impact on this world simply in the way that we've created these constructs for them. Like, it's just, it's mind boggling. Allison, I'm 40 something years old. And, you know, before COVID hit, I was looking for a violin violin instructor. And I remember when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, and my mama, and I love my mama, but she's like, you gonna play this violin. <laughs> and it's like three hours and four hours and lessons and the other lesson. And, I, and all I could think of when I was practicing is all the other things I could be doing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because I didn't like the violin. I really, really dug it. I thought it was cool. I loved how it sounded. In my head, I was gonna play violin, bass lines on hip hop tracks. But she, she, and it's like, no, you have to learn classical violin. You have to practice three, four hours and you're, you can't play hip hop violin. It doesn't exist. And, and, and before long, I tossed that thing aside. And now I find myself 30 years later longing for it. Mm -hmm. And there's a beauty in being able to long for it and connect back to it. But it's 30 years of love lost. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think, and I, and we all have to remember that, that our job is to introduce young people right? Not force young people into our version of art because they will find their truth in their own time, right? Listen, anybody who's passionate about something finds the time they devote to it. Mm -hmm. Y'all know that? Like, if, mm -hmm. if, if, like, who's, you guys all are artists. Who's here been doing something you love and you look up like, oh my gosh, it's three hours already? Like, how'd that happen? It's because your soul's calling for it. Mm -hmm. And you have to find and create circumstances that allow young folks' soul to call for the art rather than to force it down their throats. And people have argued with me about this. What do you mean? Some folks need discipline. Kids need structure. Kids need discipline. And I said, well, you know, kids can have the discipline and structure and reach certain heights of potential and then not have joy, and it defeats the purpose of going there anyway. I've met so many sad professionals, so many unhappy millionaires, so many broken people that people on the outside are like, oh my gosh, I wish I could be like, nah, you don't want to be like that person. They have no joy in their life. They have no happiness in their life. They have, no, they, they have nothing to celebrate. They, they go, they live a humdrum existence that on the outside looking in looks great. And for them, they are broken and it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. 
Have you done any work at all with um, like hip hop Shakespeare companies? Um, have you have you seen a connection with some of that? That was one of the questions that came up. No, I would love to. I've never seen it. I, I've always imagined it. I would love to connect with folks doing that work. Cause you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare was an MC fan. It's like to me, I like Shakespeare was so Drake. So let me make my connection. <laughs> Shakespeare was so Drake. So, so like Shakespeare, he, he had skills. He could write, obviously. His narratives are dope. But then if you look across his body of work, you will find like, like was that really him? Like, was that ghost written? Was that, was that outside of the norm? And for me, Drake is the exact same way. Like Drake is a great, talented writer. But like Drake released two tracks the other day with DJ Khaled. And he sounded just like The Weeknd. And the other show, he sounded like, like a little bit like Cole. And it's because, you know, folks, sometimes good writers know how to bend to create voice. And, and so they have strong voices, but they can bend for voice. And I, to me, Shakespeare and Drake, somebody needs to write a paper on how Shakespeare and Drake are connected. Um, but long story short, I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could actually even open that up to a kid. And that would just like, I mean, a child, I think about a child thinking about Drake and how there's some correlation between Drake and, and Shakespeare. I mean, that would just be, there would be this immediate no, no. But I think staffing, you know, or, oh. or sorry, assigning that, you know, and saying, go off in any direction you want to go in this, you know, I, I, could, I could be mind by, I mean, it could just be so op opening for people. Uh, yo, for like, like Allison, the most beautiful thing for me is this, when I go to a kid, I introduce a project or a program, they're like, nah, no, e, mm -mm, never, <laughs> maybe, wait, oh my God. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's the most because their natural reaction is to say this, this is outside of the norm. We should be normal. Why are you doing this? I don't like normal, but normal is comfortable. Then it's like, all right, I'm just gonna put it here, and then all of a sudden, you see that shift, and the eyes open up. You know, all the educators know this. That you know the feeling, right? When when you hear your first oh, like that that yeah. that it sounds like angels. It sounds like chorus it sounds like but it always begins with confusion or a no mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and it's like just putting it there and saying all right if you don't see it that's fine but i'm just gonna leave this here for you and you know engage on your own and inevitably it always something even interesting about the path that gets us from no to possible yes right you know you you the, you know how many of us just stay in no and how many of us just wind our way to what's possible and even that sort of um in the spirit of creativity i mean you're shaking your head no i can't tell you no no no. i'm shaking my head because like <laughs> i was about to throw the um i was about to throw the prayer the prayer cloth at the screen because <laughs> that is your that like like the path from no to possible that is yeah a, that is a, that's a lecture so no sometimes no is no Sometimes no, it's, mm, sis, you better talk. Like, so you, you were getting the latter. <laughs> yes, the path from no to possible is everything. Um, okay, let's get, let's get, um, we've got six minutes. We'll take one more question and then we will, um, we will, again, we'll make sure that we get these to you and, and we'll get some way of get them out to the team. So um, can you speak a little bit, um, and this may be too long than we have, but let's just go with it anyway. Can you speak a bit to the art of interpretation? and appreciation as steps to a larger artistic process. Gosh. Um, how can we um, empower people mm. to think um, of their eyes and ears, et cetera, as artistic tools to be leveraged um, in the process or whatever it is they're doing? Yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is it's like sort of Jerome Bruner-esque, like making meaning, make like making meaning as a way of engaging. I think interpretation, like I, I get interpretation, and I think it's very different from making meaning. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm more of a making meaning guy than an interpret, because like interpret in many ways is like, you know, take this thing and you ever, you ever heard somebody interpret, if you speak two languages and somebody interprets from one language to the other, and it's a, a literal interpretation, means different things in a different construct. Like right. so it's, it's not about interpretation for me, it's about making meaning of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that making meaning is about sitting in and with it, right? It's like, uh, it's like, um, it's like when bad, not bad meaning bad, but bad meaning good. It's like, if you only know bad is bad, to make meaning of somebody's like, yo, that jump was bad, that bad actually means good. The literal interpretation would be that bad is negative. But right. making meaning of it is like understanding the person, where they come from, the linguistic traditions, their understandings, the culture. All of a sudden, you make different meaning out of it. So I think it's about 
sitting in and with what is foreign till your body makes meaning of it. You know what I mean? Like that, that's how I see the interpretation thing. Like there are things that I've, I've not initially liked that I just sat with until my, until my body made meaning of it. And then all of a sudden I was able to, I guess now translate it into something that made, that made sense for me. You know what I mean? Like I'm a huge jazz fan now, huge. Like I'm home, it's like Charlie Parker with strings. Like, I, like it, it's my whole world. And coming up, I never listened to jazz music. And the first time I heard jazz, I was like, where's the beat? Like these cats ain't got no, they, they, ain't, got no, they ain't got no boom bap, they ain't got no bass line. And I had to make meaning of jazz for mm -hmm. it to make sense to me. And, and that required me sitting in and with what was unfamiliar and what created a little bit of like consternation because I was looking for the boom bap to give me home. And then, and then I started, and when I sat with it for long enough, it started making meaning for me. I could see, I saw notes differently. Notes spoke to me. I saw the sadness and the joy. I saw the, and so it's about sitting in and with a phenomenon until you can make meaning of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris, this is like, I, I mean, I feel I, I, I fluctuate between Dr. Chris, Dr. Chris Emden, and Chris. Chris is fine. Dr. Chris is all I'm, good. <laughs> my son's name is Chris, so it's so easy for me to say Chris. So, um, this has been amazing. Like, I have never facilitated or even been in a conversation um, for, for 90 minutes where, you know, I, I literally just don't want to stop. I just want to keep going. Um, and so we just want to thank you for, you know, being such a fan of Lincoln Center and, and certainly being a fan of, of this work and, and not just a fan, but a, I would put you in that category of, you know, you know, a disruptor, you know, a leader, um, you know, change agent, you know, an advocate, um, and, you know, an activist, you know, all of those are things in the work that you're doing. And, Thanks. And I, I just, it's, you know, there's a part of me that's like, how do I get to this point in my career and meet somebody like you? I would love to have like known you years ago and would have dropped you right in the middle of like Silicon Valley to, to, to do a lot of disruption. Um, but that doesn't have to not be the case. Um, I would say, how would you want to close this out? You know, we, we appreciate you being here, but what, what might be some words that you would leave everybody with? I, I want to close with saying to everyone who's here, I'm looking now and it says 250 something people. Um, to each of you, like, I see you, um, I recognize you, I appreciate you. Your time is so valuable that you took your time to sit in and with us for 90 entire minutes is such a gift. And yeah. so no new information, just saying I thank you, I see you, I recognize you, and I hope we continue to stay in communication. Next. Yes. Thank you guys for participating. Thank you, Dr. Oh, wait, shout out, shout out. I'm so sorry. Oh. Shout out to Allison. Shout out to Darrell. Shout out to Jean. Jean is so dope and so popping. Um, shout out to um, Jesse for like working on our tech. Shout out to the ASL interpreters. Like, I was going to say, let's, let's my goodness. These, these going guys are, like, and flowing and, and expressing emotion. You guys are magical at your yes. craft. So shout out to all of y'all for all you do. And I'll see you all soon.